Now please welcome to the stage the next panel to discuss creating equal leadership opportunities for women. It is moderated by Mary Davis, the Dean of the University of Kentucky, J. David Rosenberg College of Law. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Secretary Newman, for your remarks. It is a pleasure to share the stage with Dr. Carrie Healy, Lieutenant Colonel Amy McGrath, and Ms. Gwen Young, who have spent their careers leading and creating opportunities for other women to lead in all fields of endeavor, from education, business, the military and government service, to politics. I'd like to give a brief introduction of each of them and then ask a few questions and we will enjoy the conversation that ensues. Dr. Carrie Healy, president of the Milken Center for Advancing the American Dream. Her career spans higher education, elected office, the, the uh, Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, uh, and foreign and domestic policy. In July of 2018, she kept six years as the first woman president of Babson College ranked as the country's leading institution in entrepreneurship education. Lieutenant Colonel Amy McGrath, the founder of Honor Bound, is a U.S. Naval Academy graduate who served as a Marine F.A. 18 pilot and weapons system officer with three combat deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan. After her operational flying tours, she served as a congressional fellow in the Pentagon. Um, and liaison for the Marine Corps to the State Department and had a tour teaching political science at the U.S. Naval Academy. In 2018 and 2020, she ran a, um, for the U.S. House and then the Senate from Kentucky. Finally, Gwen Young. Ms. Young is the Chief Operating Officer of the Women Business Collaborative. She's also a visiting scholar at the Elliott School of International Affairs. Gwen is the, um, is is the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University and former director of the Global Women's Leadership Initiative and Women in Public Service Project at the Wilson Center. She is an advisor to Concordia and president of Balance Up Leadership. The backgrounds of these women are extraordinary. So Dr. Healy, I come to you first. What issues have you had to address in your career to create more opportunities for women to lead? Yeah, it, it's an interesting question because we see everywhere in every sector, whether it's politics or academia or, or business, that, that women are, are lagging behind, just as the Secretary of State said. And, and there seem to be these, these invisible barriers, these glass ceilings that usually top out somewhere between 20 and 30 percent, depending on what you're, what you're talking about. Um, and, and the answer to breaking through those, those ceilings is usually pretty subtle and, and unknown to the people who are trying to bat at those obstacles. So we know there are obstacles there, but often we don't know exactly what they are. And so you get a, a, an approach from many women's groups of just sort of you know, throwing the spaghetti at the wall and trying to see, see what works. You know, let's try more training. Let's try you know, trying to uh, you know, create uh, support groups or all sorts of approaches. And, and often the, the, the progress just doesn't materialize. And so I think one of the hardest things that I've been doing is to try to think, uh, whether it's in a political context or in the context of being President Babson, you know, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And I was very fortunate at Babson to come into a situation where some professors had been doing some research called the Diana Project for a number of years, and it was looking at the number, or, uh, the number of women who were receiving uh, venture capital funding for their entrepreneurial projects. Now that may seem pretty obscure, maybe, but what's the answer? It was 2%, 2% uh, of the projects that were being funded were women-led. And so when you ask yourself, why aren't women becoming C-suite? You know, why aren't, why aren't their projects getting off the ground? Why is there a, a wealth gap between uh, men and women? A lot of it had to do with that lack of access to capital. And, and if you hadn't had that research, which got it's very granular, and then it went beyond that and said, well, why aren't they getting, why aren't they getting the money? And it's not because women-led businesses were less profitable. They were able to prove that they actually were more profitable. And it wasn't because 
those, thing, those companies with women on the boards were less profitable either. They were actually more profitable too. It was just that the people who were selecting them, the people who were actually deciding where the money went, were all men. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't relate to a lot of the entrepreneurial projects that were being uh, presented. And it was shown that if you had more women who were actually on those deciding boards of the venture capital companies, more women would get money and they would actually make more money for the firm. So sometimes you just have to get very, very deep into the specific problem about what's holding women back. And in that case, it was these attitudes about you know, first of all, we don't really know that there's a market for what these women are suggesting. And number two, we're worried that they won't be as profitable. So I, I would just say you need to dig in deep and find out exactly what the objections are and how to get over them. Honestly, that's a great segue to Lieutenant Colonel McGrath because you have created an organization called Honorbound mm -hmm. to encourage women with service backgrounds to pursue leadership opportunities, including elected office. It's not clear that women who have an interest in elected office, really know the pathway to, to accomplish that. So tell us what inspired you to create that opportunity for women and how you help the women who are engaged in it to overcome some of these challenges. Well, what we see um, you know, in, in business, uh, as, as was stated, is that there are some barriers um, to women, and there's barriers to women in politics, right? I mean, Look at our legislature at the federal level. We're only, you know, women are only like 25%. I'm here in 2022. We're still only 25%. So why is that? And when you pull the string on it, it's, it's, it's similar in a sense that women win their races at the same rate as men. Why are there only 25% women in places like Congress? Because we don't run at the same rate as men. And so what my organization does and what I'm trying to do is inspire women to run. It takes a lot of courage to do that in today's political environment. I mean, it's, it's tough, right? A lot of people don't wanna get into that, that arena, but it's so important to have competent, dedicated public servants who will step into the arena and the focus for me is on women who have served the country because I, my personal belief is that, you know, people who have been able to serve the country uh, can hopefully, uh, when they get into office, put the country above their own political party. At, and that is, is something that, like, hey, you've proven that you can do this already. Um, you're somebody who's tough. You know, those of us that served in the military are pretty tough. And, and so you can do this, and that's the piece, that inspiration piece. It's also, that's just one piece. And, and when I would like to go back to just, just being in the military, because you brought up you know, the, the barriers for women. In the Marine Corps, I was in the Marine Corps for 20 years. Loved it, loved it. But there were a lot of barriers to, for women rising in the Marine Corps. One was structural meaning the laws had to change for us to be able to even do the jobs like fly fighter jets. That's structural. But once that was changed, we still had barriers, and the barriers were more, more cultural. And to find out how to change those to keep women in uh, does take a lot of research. You know, when we were losing women, and a, a lot of times when you, when you pull the string on it, it's, wow, we need to invest more in daycare, you know, to, to keep, Fighter pilots, flying. You know, these are, these are things that you don't think about, but you know, once we do the research, we can really make a difference. Right, absolutely. And Gwen, this really segues beautifully to your question because we've talked about now these systemic policy changes that are needed in order for women to lead across sectors. So what are some of the organizational and systemic changes and also policy changes that you think are necessary to ensure that women have these opportunities to lead. No, thank you. And I'd like to, you know, Carrie and Amy, you were talking about sort of the data and the research and kind of the use of that data is really important, which leads to organizations, whether that's a business, having a commitment, right? A top leadership commitment. This isn't a line of business. The commitment to this is not off to the side in an office somewhere, but there is um, a direct commitment to this because representation does matter. And what we're finding, you know, across politics and across business is that, you know, inclusive hiring and recruiting, right? So that's transparency and succession planning. 
you know, these are sort of policies within the business that are saying, you know, this is the commitment, this is how we're going to hire, this is how we're going to promote. You know, you read the McKinsey studies, women come in at managers at about a 40% level, and by the time you're up, it's that next broken rung, they call it. By the time you get to VP or senior leadership, you're down to 10% or under, and that's worse for women of color. The second thing, you know, one of the biggest barriers, too, is, is the networks, right? There's a, a friend of mine, Laura Liswood, always says, it's not a glass ceiling, it's a thick layer of men, right? It's access to those networks, it's having those networks, and so that's leadership development and allyship, right? Really being able to have both mentors, sponsors, and allies that will help you rise. And into senior leadership in business, helping you rise with certain skill sets such as PL responsibility. And then as Amy said, you know, one of the biggest barriers, and it's a policy thing, is flexible works option and family leave, right? There's just simply not enough access to paid parental leave or caregiving leave right at this moment in time. And we're seeing it in the news and you're seeing that crisis. So some of these things you need to really look at is, is you know, compensation, your policies around family leave and time off, your policies around your leadership development, access to networks, how you promote, how you allocate work in your business, what projects women get, what things they're, they're looking at. And, um, and those are sort of some of the, the changes that need to happen. But I wanna emphasize that those changes need to happen kind of from the top with a, with a sheer commitment be transparent and use the data, pull research and use those data and analytics in your HR and talent management, but as you're making business decisions, because we're seeing the numbers, you hear the 2.1 trillion coming out of McKinsey, if women were employed at a rate equally to men, you know that profits are rising in the business sector. We know that GDP grows if women are in public service. So use that data, make it transparent and make a commitment to changing your systems and policies so that women can rise from the start up into senior leadership. So the organizational commitment piece is a challenge, right? We talk the language of wanting to provide opportunities for women. Uh, every organization that we've probably ever been a part of spoke that language. And yet, we know that in the moment when we are each seeking an opportunity, maybe that organizational commitment isn't quite as robust as it was depicted or as it was represented. So. How do we secure that commitment from the organizations that we are a part of? How have you each tried to secure that commitment? Now, that's a question, but I said my goal was to facilitate conversation, yes. so I'm also happy for you to respond to anything that you've already heard or questions you want to ask one another. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to respond to this notion that, uh, that women have other needs, right? You, you brought up the, the question of childcare. Um, so is it, shall I be a fighter pilot or shall I take care of my kids? You're going to take care of your kids. And the most interesting uh, statistic I've seen recently is that when you ask men and women what is the most important determination of when you're looking for a new job, two-thirds of all women said work-life balance. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to meet your commitments both at home and also at work. And for men, it was just salary and promotion and you know, all, the, all the normal things. You know, and, and so look at that and dig into it, because that is data, right? That's important data. That tells us that women need more things to succeed, that they still are making these tough decisions, you know, whether we want them to or not. And that, to me, speaks to the fact that, that corporate culture has been created by generations of male leadership who didn't have these concerns. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you have, I'm starting a new organization right now, the Center for Advancing the American Dream, and we've been able to build it from scratch. And what I'm finding really interesting is that if you, if you create a culture that's very open in terms of people's responsibilities to their children or, or um, other loved ones, aging parents, et cetera, um, you not only see women come forward with those needs, but you see men come forward with them as well. And we're, you know, we, we all know the names of our colleagues' kids, and we, you know, we, we try to um, you know, say out loud when someone has a family obligation that they need to go take care of. It changes the culture, and it makes it okay to be like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right, and one of the things that we can all do is continue to talk about this. I know that, you know, that's it's just talk is, is talk, but it's important. Uh, from the governmental perspective, from the military or the Marine Corps, I mean, change comes from within, but it comes also from um, the, leader, the political leadership. So who we elect in office matters. Those policies, not only from a business perspective, but also from a governmental perspective, 
paid family leave, that sort of thing matters. From the, from the Marine Corps perspective, uh, or the Navy, you know, the reason policies don't change, and you sort of alluded to it, is that you know, a lot of the leadership, they, they, they believe that they want more women. They sort of understand that. They, they want to mentor women to get to the top and that sort of thing. But when it comes to the actual nitty gritty policies, they are all men in the room. And so you need to have more women in the room, and which is particularly difficult in the military when you rise through the ranks, because they're the ones making the decisions. So you've got to come from the outside, too. Absolutely. Go ahead. I think, I think to that about sort of, you know, the representation matters, right? That who's in the room and who's there and who's making that decision. But I also think, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's the bias piece of this, right? Whether you call it bias, whether you call it sexism, and it's really hard, people don't know what they don't know, right? So if a workplace um, is created by men and the systems are created, it's hard for them to see the challenges, right? And it's almost, they, you know, research shows it's made worse by public com commitments. I'm gonna increase more diversity, equity, inclusion, I'm gonna bring in more women, but not really understanding how to do that nor actually taking the granularity. So this piece of really looking at the data, making it transparent, there are gender audits that have to be, and then pay parity, that's a big thing, some tr transparent pay bands, you know, if you're in the government, the GS, levels are listed, you know, that transparency is really important, but it's it's the conversations and it's being able to to call this out and, and for the, the dominant structures, we call it to understand what those barriers are, what policies and changes need to be made and to be able to really do, do that work. It's, it's hard work to do, it's hard to realize, it's hard to make a organization or a cultural change, but, you know, perception, bias, that's you know at least sixty percent of what a lot of this is, and you need to be able to to talk through that and make that change. Right. And that takes a lot of courage too. And so what I would like to do in the three or so minutes that we have left is ask each of you if there is a particular takeaway from your own leadership journeys that you'd like to share as we wrap up our conversation. And so Gwen, I'm going to start with you. I think one of um, one of the things I've learned, and I, I heard it at a Women in Intel group a couple of weeks ago, is to be able to stand up to the systems and policies and be able to call that out in a way that is productive and professional and makes sense, and not just to sit back and accept it. So whether that's a family leave policy, whether that's the behavior in the workplace, or whether that's a policy system that needs to be changed, be able to have that conversation. And I think. And that, it, that's just as much about using the voice, but what that's about is that recognizing that those changes need, need to be made. And I've, I've stood up in, in various platforms with, you know, all, being the only woman in the room and saying, this policy needs to change for these reasons and these are why. And uh, we have the evidence, you know, but let's, let's make that change. And so being able to step up and do that is something that, um, that's been very important to me, but it's something I've learned that you actually need to say something and, and, and build the support to do that. All right, Amy? I'm convinced that the people that make the difference in this world are the ones who are not afraid to fail and not afraid to do the hard things, to have the courage to do the hard things. Whatever it is that's in your life, uh, in your business, that you think is hard, that it, it's going to take somebody who's a bold leader to do it, be the one. That's what our country needs. Yeah. Here, here. Um, I yeah. think that my, my takeaway recently has been a one that I'm thinking about how we imagine careers and imagine career paths. And women are going to live longer than men, they just do. And they also have more interruptions uh, during the course of their life. And so to start thinking about that as an advantage, as an opportunity to uh, have longer careers, to stay in the workforce longer, to be more productive, and to do more different things over time. And the corollary there would be that you would need to start thinking of yourself as someone who has skills as opposed to someone who has a particular career path. Mm -hmm. And so, so many women I know uh, knew in the 80s and the 90s who got law degrees, and then they became mothers, and then they felt that they couldn't do anything because they'd gotten off that path or if they had started out in banking and they'd gotten off that path. Um, if you thought about what are the skills that I have that I want to bring when I come back into the workforce again, then that changes your whole perspective. And my own life has taught me 
that you know, I started out as a researcher, I went into politics, I ended up in academia, and, and now I'm building a cultural institution. And the way I did that is I just thought about, well, where do my, where do my skills and my strengths lead me, not where does this particular career lead me. Honestly, I'm so excited to have had the opportunity to listen to these wonderful women talk about how courageous they have been, that they wouldn't admit it, uh, because every time a woman does a hard thing, and we do it a lot throughout our careers to get to the positions that these amazing women have achieved, takes a lot of courage and the doing of a lot of hard things. And I'm thrilled to have a chance to meet you and share this conversation with our audience. Please join me in thanking our panelists.